time I come here, I run the risk of something. I run the risk of people twisting words or listening through their own special listening devices. You know, the kind that takes words and hears what they want to hear. And I can't fix that. But I can tell you why I do what I do. I don't just come here to fill time. I don't just come here so that I can address you and then go about my business. I've told you something happened to me along the way. I didn't plan this for my life, nor am I complaining about it. I stopped that, thank God. <laughs> At least for a little while. Radio people, my fingers were crossed. Being a Christian is not easy. And being a Christian pastor is kind of tough. And what happens when you get people who are not clear on what it is first to be a Christian and then what it means to be a pastor? You have a recipe for disaster. You have a train wreck waiting to happen. You can call this the most unique message I've ever delivered. Unique because through the early part of the week, I, th I thought I had a message until something came across my desk. And then I realized I need to address something in a message, a full message. Because ultimately, if I'm not clear on what I'm saying, and you don't understand the importance of at least trying to make progress in understanding, then I have failed in my calling. I take my calling seriously. The staff was kind enough to, well, maybe they were cruel, I love them, kind enough to show me a clip from 13 years ago. I stood on the platform beside Dr. Scott who had just announced to the congregation his cancer had returned. He came into the sanctuary in the cathedral and was so down in his spirit. I don't need to tell you why. It was the lack of faithfulness on the part of the congregation. As I've told you before, I did not necessarily understand it because I wasn't in his shoes. I, I didn't have that yet or soon to be placed on my life, true understanding of what it means to be an under-shepherd. I don't even remember this. They showed me this clip, but until you showed me, I didn't remember it. In fact, you were the one that said to me, do you realize you've been saying the same thing for 13 years, even before you became pastor? My lament, a little bit younger, a little bit fatter faced and curly haired, but the same message. And what I said to you, as I listened back to it, was hard for me to listen to. I said, you know, you, you don't know what you have until you lose it. Little did I know, little did anyone know, that two years later, my husband would be dead. I remember the day of his funeral. I had never seen that many people packed into the building. And in a bold statement, I said, there'll be church here next Sunday, there'll be a message here. I remember thinking, where were all of these people while this man lived? Where were they? Through, the whole, through 30 years of ministry, and I've got tapes upon tapes upon tapes of, boy, these are the top seven that they pulled for me. They span from, they begin at uh, 1985 and go clear to the year 2004. Not berating, teaching you, trying to teach you as a people that being a Christian is not always easy and being a pastor is even more difficult. 
the rod of correction is difficult for me to carry, and I know I must, it's part of my calling. It wasn't easier for Gene Scott. It grieved him to the core when he had to come, and by the way, no one could deliver a blowtorch like he could. In fact, I'm gonna try and find a way to say this nicely. These seven things are called, for you parishioners and for me, because I was a parishioner too, are called soil your pants moments when Gene Scott got mad. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. But he didn't get mad because he was some dictator or he had some messiah complex. He got mad because he watched people who would write in, they would call in and say, Doc, you're the best and there's no better to... My saying something you haven't heard before? You're the best. But why was it that the best could never have people come out and be faithful? Some came out for a little while and then they petered off. Now, I think that it's time for me to do this so that you can understand, because I want to smoke this out today. I don't want to start another 10 years with Levin here. Some of you do not understand. Some of you are newer. You do not understand what it is to be a pastor, to be called of God, as the Apostle Paul said, God gave gifts. The Greek word is domata, and that is not a masculine word. It is a neutral word. It means men and women, gift ministers, were given by God to his church, his ecclesia, his outcalled ones, not a building, a people, for a specific thing, to bring them to completion, for something else very specific, which I will go on to say. Being a pastor, I am a pastoring teacher. Being a pastor requires at times for me to do things that I don't want to do. It hurts me. It grieves me. Sometimes it embarrasses me. But you are spiritual children. I don't care for the oldest member in this church. Some of you have been here for 35, 36, etc. years, and some of you are up in age. You are spiritual children. You are not called to fill the pulpit. And anyone who self-appoints themselves or nominates themselves is a lunatic. Because what comes with this, if someone is truly called, is a burden for souls. The book of Hebrews talks about, don't grieve your leaders, for they watch for your souls. And I think a lot of these things become Christian buzzwords. But using... Dr. Scott's taxonomy. You remember the taxonomy? He got from his professor, and then he took it, and he developed it even more. And then he began to apply this taxonomy to other institutions, other churches, really changing and revolutionizing the way some of the largest denominations in America functioned changing the way they operated using his taxonomy. In his taxonomy, I'm only looking to do one thing today. I want to highlight something, and then I'm going to ask when I'm done. If you're any closer, forgive me, I don't mean to be condescending, but if you're any closer to taking hold of the message today, because by virtue of something that happened this week, I now understand not only Am I not communicating properly? But some of you cannot hear. Now, I'm just going to say this to you. I take my calling seriously. I believe I will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. If you read your Bible, you know that there's the bima, which Paul talks about to the Corinthians, the judgment seat where rewards are handed out. And then there's the white throne judgment. We as Christians do not appear before the white throne judgment. Th these are people who the dead, the great, and the small will appear before him, and they will be judged upon their works. Now, for those that are in Christ, Romans 8 says, there is no more ultimate condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And that judgment that will be meted out at the white throne judgment, which is in the book of Revelation, that fell upon Christ. Christ bore that for us. Galatians talks about the curse falling on him so that we could pass out from underneath that curse and be covered by the blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ to be freed from the law, 
to be justified, to be made right by faith in Jesus Christ alone, not by works, by faith. I have faithfully taught these things for 10 years. So I take it seriously when people are not listening properly. It means I must go back and I must reiterate, I must clarify. I will stand and give account at the judgment seat, the Bema, for what I said, how, listen carefully, how I instructed you in your faith life. It's not a small thing to me when somebody is sitting in my midst who cannot understand my pastoral care, which means at times I must do the things that even I do not desire to do. To correct people is never pleasant unless you have the Spirit of God, unless God has given you the Spirit to understand correction and have a right attitude towards it, whereby even if you're not guilty, you turn around and say, thank you, I always need that extra tap on the shoulder and sometimes a sharp rebuke or sometimes just a word, as the scripture says, in perfect season for what is going on. I'm responsible for what happens under this roof, not you. I will give account. Now, if I slacked off on my commitment, I can tell you I would be very nervous. That's not to say that I'm still not nervous, but I don't have a spirit of fear. Surely, standing here in front of you for 10 years, is there anybody here who thinks I have a spirit of fear? No. Well, I'm glad that at least most of you said that because it takes a great amount of courage to go through what I've been put through. And I, I'm not asking for your sympathy, but when somebody says that I have a spirit of fear, I have survived. My 10th anniversary represents what God has done in my life, not my accomplishments. My accomplishments count for nothing. It represents God's calling on my life. I'm celebrating what the Lord has done, making a way where there is no way because I serve the God of impossibilities. I serve a God who uses flawed containers. I serve a God who has abundant grace for the worst offender. But I do not have a spirit of fear. I know where I have placed my trust. I've told you I don't seek to make friends. I wish to love you in the Lord. And if you come to hate me, you come to hate me as someone in the flesh, not in the spirit. Because the spirit bears witness unto the things that are said and done in the Lord. So when we're clear about these things, it makes my job, my calling, a little bit easier. Most people who have attended church for most of their lives have not been pastored. They may have been taught, maybe, but they have not been pastored. And when I say this, there is a worldview of what a pastor ought to do. People say, first of all, a pastor ought to look the part. A pastor has to set the tone for everybody so that you can imitate. Boy, that worked out well for some of the great names in uh, Protestant evangelical uh, circles. Thank God we're not following people, we're following Christ. I've told you that. I don't ask you to do as I do and be as I am. For God's sakes, I am just as frail and as fallible. I make mistakes just like you. But you follow me as I follow Christ. And if it means that you understand, and I say this with a heart of love, I speak, as the scripture says, the truth in love, that you are sheep. If you could find your way, if you could find your way, you would not need a domata, and that's why God gave gifts to the church. I do not take lightly my calling. When I travel to institutions and facilities, people have asked me this, why are you a pastor? It is not because Dr. Scott didn't have anybody else. That's what the naysayers would like you to believe. God was preparing me before I even knew who God was. Just as God called and prepared you for this journey, there are no accidents. There's free will, but no accidents. So when people say, why? 
I say at the basis of it all is because first I'm a Christian and I do understand what a Christian means to be a Christian. Let's use a little bit of Dr. Scott's taxonomy and write just a few things here. So those who need uh, dual learning, audio and visual, we have purpose, function, structure, and I'm not going to do the whole taxonomy, but controlling forces. I only want to look at really the purpose for what I'm going to do today. And the purpose, you could analyze any entity, any church, any business, any organization. You could even analyze yourself on this taxonomy. I know that sounds strange to analyze oneself, but you could. And this bifurcates into subjective and objective purposes. So subjective, we would say, is what people, subjective, what people think. And everybody has thoughts, everybody has ideas of, let's talk about the church, the purpose of the church. There are a lot of subjective ideas of what the church is, but we're only concerned with the objective purposes. Those are the written, official documents set out usually by the founder, or the one who establishes. In this case, we are talking about the Bible. That is what I'm looking at. So when people say, where are you going to get this message from? My source is the Bible. Now, if you've been listening to me for 10 years, I've told you I have no other message apart from Scripture. Have I not said this? Good. So you can imagine, I've also built on this and said when I've done this taxonomy before, that if we're following the objective, which is the official written documents, which in this case is the Bible, uh, Old and New Testament, then I took license in a, a lesson I did on this probably two years ago. Jesus said, I will build my church. Now, how can I know when people are not listening to me? Real easy. When you write me a letter and you say, my church. When you write me a letter and you say, my church will not be this, I know you have not heard a word I've been saying because I've told you I'm just a steward here and you are stewards. And the only person on the stage of history who can call it mine, that personal possessive pronoun, is Jesus Christ. Have I not said that to you? Yes, Praise God. At least 99% were listening when I said it. That, that comforts me. Now, this is going to go somewhere because if somebody said, well, how do you pastor the church? I'm going to do it right in front of you right now. I'm going to show you what a little bit, I'm, I'm not fully matured, but a little bit of maturity. Ten years ago, I would have handled this differently and not made it a learning event for all of us, but we're going to learn from this. We're going to learn from what I'm about to address, and I'm praying that you will take it with you and make it a life lesson. Don't think that's you, because you've seen the circle before. Except this time, instead of it being the self, what's in the circle is that objective purpose, the Word, the Word of God. That's what's in the circle for us today. And here we have a little bit of division. I should have made that circle just a little bit smaller. Eh, nothing's perfect. All right, here we go. We'll write in a different color because I'm going to have to write over my writing. So in one corner we have what the Word of God reveals about God, who He is character, nature, creator. And perhaps the one that sums it up is Malachi. Put here Malachi 3.6. I am the Lord, I change not. So if you're reading the Word of God and that's front and center, that's one. What else does the Word of God do? The Word of God reveals something about you. The Word of God reveals who you are. If you don't have a right point of departure, 
your walk is going to be a disaster. Start with the fact that Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned. Have I not said that for 10 years? I didn't say, I'm here and I'm spiritual, or you're over there. Everybody, that's the condition. Everybody has fallen short of the glory of God. So, what happens with the Word of God? It is either received or rejected. If received, if received, we might say like Paul talking to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 2, and I believe it's verse 13, he was praising them because they received the word that he preached not as the word of man, but as the word of God. That's the way they received it. Now, there are other people who would reject the word. Romans 1.22, professing themselves to be wise, they became foolish. And we know that the word of God from the book of Hebrews tells us is alive sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing essentially into the being of each individual. The same words bring life to some and death to others. Now that's all pretty straightforward, wouldn't you say? Yes. Good. The Word of God also includes your calling. Your calling, past, present, and future. You're calling in past because we know that God called out before the worlds were formed. He spoke your name. Past, sins covered. Past, perhaps as a tool, but things that are past that brought you to this present time and have prepared you for the future. So when you think of the Word of God, it encompasses all of that. Now, as I said, I was called to the ministry. When I think about my calling, I think about the seriousness of it all. Now, I don't come into your homes and tell you how to live your life. Have I ever said, hey, I'm going to come and I'm going to check up on you. I want to know what you're doing. I don't want to know. I've told you that. Because if I knew, it might scare me. <laughs> I don't want to know. I don't want to come into your home. I don't want to interfere. People say, well, you don't never talk about uh, people's sexual preference or what they are. Listen, you work, I teach you the word of God. You take that word and you work it out with him. It's not a manufacturing process. You must wrestle it out with him by faith. I give you the tools. That's my calling. Now, I've also said to you, I'm responsible for what goes on here. So when I say I'm either instructing or teaching, the teaching and instruction is not only put to the test through the week, but the reality, the metal test, is when the Word of God is put to the test, what, excuse me, brothers and sisters, what will you do? That isn't get out and do something. That means when the stuff hits the fan, are you going to apply what you learned, or is it going to simply stay in the cerebral state or even forgotten because it's a message that was preached so long ago you don't even remember it? Which is why I started the year with the abiding principle. That was my first message. Abide in the Word. Abide a Word. Stay in the Word of God. That is the way you stay connected. I'm still not at my message yet, and I'm building towards something. Now, I've told you I'm a student. When I say I'm a student, I'm a student of Christ. No man or woman is qualified to stand in a pulpit who does not remain a lifelong student of the Word. Many, many people who are in the pulpit do not spend the time in the Word. Now, I like to think of myself, and forgive me, but I'll make my own analogies, like a tea bag that's been steeped for a long, long, long time in the Word, in a sh relatively in a short period of time, but long as in taking it all in and trying to infuse to others. Poor analogy, perhaps, but that's the way I view myself, taking in and feeding you and putting the information out there to help you on your walk. But I'm also, when I say I'm a student of Christ, I'm also a teacher. And as a teacher, my calling as a teacher. Some of you have seen over the years, I like to dig in books and I'll 
Uh, poor, I told you, the poor people that have to put away my books and pick up after me. I feel sorry for them because I'll, books are everywhere and I'm, I'm a person of the book. Not a bibliolatra, but a person of the book. But if all of that information just stays inside of me, what a waste. So I come and I bring it to you as I kind of try and make it so that every type of listener can, can hear and receive something. On top of being a student and a teacher, I'm a pastor. And those two cannot be separated. When you are a teacher, you are also shepherding people. In this case, I'm an under-shepherd. Christ is the great shepherd. I'm an under-shepherd. And the difficulty with that is none of this is part of the natural man or woman. If I were just a hireling, friends, two things would have happened. I would have said to you, I want more than a dollar, which I haven't collected from the church, and you will pay because I'm, I am going to be very expensive. And I would say, I don't really care what you do, and I don't care what happens. Now, is there anybody in the sound of my voice who does not understand this? I'm not asking you to agree for the sake of agreement. I'm asking you to take a, just a second before you open your mouth. It's a big statement I'm going to make. I love Jesus and his church so much, it's worth not only fighting for, it's worth dying for. Does anybody here not know that about me? I'll make it easy for you. That is what I live for. If you take away that which is the most sacred and the most dear to me, I really do understand I have no other purpose in life. My purpose is to minister the word, to teach people. And yes, as unpleasant as it is, sometimes to correct. It'd be wonderful if a pastor could do all of this and do it with joy. But sometimes it's difficult. As I told you, if I was just a hireling, I'd say, hey, I'm just passing my time. I will collect money. And at some point, I will get out of jail. That's monopoly. Sorry, wrong matter here. <laughs> just checking if you were listening. As pastor, I have the right to the responsibility over this church if I'm going to give an answer, and I have the authority over this church, both of which are serious. Now, if heaven and hell are not a reality to you, they are to me. And my goal is to come and to teach you whether you think maybe you have the carpenter's son syndrome, or isn't it like Jesus, isn't that the carpenter's son, isn't that Gene Scott's wife? I don't care if the garbage pail is teaching you. You better listen. If it's the word of God coming from somebody's mouth and it's being rightly divided, you better pay attention. And if it happens to be that that person cares enough to love you, some people say love people into the kingdom, that doesn't mean I'm, I'm slobbering all over you. Sometimes love is tough. Sometimes love comes in the form, you, come on, some of you parents whose children have turned their backs on you. They get to an age where they just say, I don't want to know anything. We had one just this last year. I don't want to know anything. You brought this child into the world. You gave this child food, changed its diapers, took care, paid the bills, and suddenly in the age of emancipation or later, hey, I'm on my own and get out of my life. And you pray. That's all you can do as a parent is pray that your child might come to know all you ever wanted as a parent was to give your child a better life than what you had. Even if you didn't grow up in the projects or have a depressed childhood, you want more for your children. Is this true, parents? Yes. Well, I want more for you. You had a wonderful teacher in Dr. Scott, and there'll never be another one of those. But some of you are still immature. This is hard for me to say, but some of you are still very immature when it comes to the faith. My heart says, give them time. You can't, remember the tree? You can't tell the tree to bear fruit. It must come in due time. But I will bring the word, and by the Spirit of God, and what I call the tenacity of faith, eventually the word does take hold and produces new life in you and produces a change. 
in even the way you see and view the Church of Jesus Christ. Now, I am the pastor of this church, so I have to do what I'm called to do. I've tried to instruct you. I've tried to tell you things that are important to me because I've come to know they're important because they're in this word. How many times have I said to you, Matthew 7, judge not and you shall not be judged. You read it, but how many times have I said it here and on festival? Don't judge people. Have I said this? Yes, sir. Now ask you a question, because I'm getting to my point briefly here. Ask you a question. Why do we have a double standard? Why is it that I tell you, for the love of God, protect yourselves, understand what it means when you judge one another, understand what it means when you sit in judgment of me, because by the very same measure that you judge one another or me, and it's worse for me when you sit in judgment of me, by that measure, you will be judged. By your own petard, you hang yourself. If you really take these words, and they have become life-giving words, you understand they were not given to just be tossed away like a thought. They're to be meditated on. What does it mean to not judge? And I've told you, as your pastor, you only have one thing you can judge me on that you're allowed to judge me on. Am I rightly dividing the word of God. That's your only place where you are allowed to judge me. And if I'm not, there's the exit. I invite you to go because my heart's in only one place. I have no ego. I have been demoralized by people. I have been trodden on. I have been slandered. I have no ego in this except to see you as children of his precious kingdom enter in one day and understand that the life you lived was a life lived full of Christ in you, guided by his spirit, guided by someone who cared enough to tell you, pay attention to this. Don't try and imitate it. Don't try and emulate it. Just pay attention to it. It's important. Now, why were the people called Christians in the first place? You ask anybody. I asked a couple of people over the last couple of days, what does it mean when you say someone's a Christian? People will come out and say, well, a Christian is or does. But I want you to go to the first cause. They were first called Christians at Antioch. Acts 11 records that. And it wasn't Christians calling other Christians Christians. Pagans called the Christians Christians. If you understand that, there's something radical that happened at Antioch that I haven't even attempted to... to uncover the grace of God that that place, Antioch, if you think about it, which has at its core, trace it back into history, when Alexander the Great conquered the then known world and then he died and four generals split territories, and then one territory is consumed into another becoming Syria, and Antioch becomes the capital, which also becomes the hub where they were first called Christians. It's quite radical, God's controlling history to take the language and the people and give that prominence and give that special place. They were first called Christians at Antioch. And why were they called Christians? Because they were followers of Christ. Now, in the first early church, they were called those who were in the way. Not, you're in the way, but <laughs> they were following the way. And most people today are just in the way. They're not following the way. So when we talk about what it means to be a Christian, I found something that I thought was kind of cool, even though I don't, um, I don't necessarily agree with a lot of things that he said. He has a little bit different doctrine, but good old H.A. Ironside, in his commentary on the book of Acts, done in 1943, he says, a Christian is Christ's representative here in this world. Many years ago when I was studying Cantonese, one of the branches of the Chinese language, I found the word used for Christian was Yasu Yan. Yasu was their word for Jesus, and Yan was man. Whenever my teacher would introduce me, he would say I was a Jesus man. That's what a Christian really is. Now, if you think about it, it's kind of homey, but we say 
Christ is formed in your heart by faith. If you believe what Romans 5 says, that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, we become a deposit of God's nature as impossible, as miraculous to the worst sinner, placed in our hearts, a measure of God placed in us. So if we understand what that means, I once listened to a message where Dr. Scott said, being a Christian means little Christs. Supposedly, we're being conformed to his image and likeness. Now, I do have a message about the church, you and me. But before I read or give you the message, I want to read something to you and show you two, two ways of thinking about something. See, the same word brings life to some and death to others. And I'm using this as a tool. Ten years ago, I would have taken this, and in immaturity, I would not have used it as a lesson. I would have just been angry, because obviously, there are people who don't understand what I'm about. And that's OK. I'm willing to be misunderstood for Christ's sake. Here is a letter from a person, without disclosing anything except what they say in their letter is, that as I was teaching a couple of weeks ago on the resurrection, and they were jotting down mess they were jotting down notes while I was teaching. They were jotting down, scratching notes as fast as I could. There came a real desire to tell and share with people what I have been learning from you about our Savior Jesus Christ. That's life into a person. Not I'm scared what people will think or should I go out and lasso people? I've told you I'm against that, but something should happen. Something should happen that either pricks your conscience, makes you think, makes you contemplate. That's one way. In another way, people who claim to have been listening to me for 10 years said they were leaving the church this last week because um, I'm berating you as a congregation and I'm not treating, essentially the gist of this is I'm not treating you fairly and they don't want our church to become an internet church just because 30 or 40 members don't show up regularly. Now, let me explain something to you. I stay in the Word of God probably 40 to 60 hours a week, every waking hour that I'm able to be in the Word. My Bible talks about in Luke 15, believe me, I don't try to memorize chapter and verse. I tell it so you can go look it up. Luke 15, 4 talks about which one of you has 99 sheep, but one loses its way and you don't go after the one. Now, find a little bit of compassion. If there's any of this sitting in front of me to understand, going after 30 or 40 or 50 is going after lost sheep who think that there's better greens out there, better pasture and better place, and sometimes you just have to say, let it go. But for 10 years, I have said, don't judge the people who left and come back. Don't, have I said that? Don't look to your left. <laughs> Don't look to your right. Don't look at people like, hey, where were you when the stuff was going on here? You don't judge people. But then on top of all that, the letter closes with saying they're going to pray for me that the spirit of fear that is attacking me be rebuked. Let me tell you something, friends. And that's why I want to make sure, because a little leaven contaminates the whole. It's like cancer. I want to make sure I eliminate this today. I am a pastor. I am not a puppet. I am not a hireling. This even hurts me. And why it hurts me is because this was spoken in ignorance, because obviously they did not listen to what I said. I said, I'm speaking to you, and I actually pointed at the camera. But even if I didn't do that, you all know, frankly, this is the way it is. Jesus said, you will be hated without a cause. He didn't say, you're going to live your best life. He didn't say, the multitudes will come. My my calling is to make sure you understand what your calling is. My calling is to make sure that not only do I provide you spiritual handles to hold on by faith when the, when the going, as they were singing, when, 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 when they can't, when you can't get up, he, he lifts you up, he raises you up because his shoulders are strong, because when we are weak, he is strong. My goal is not only to teach you that, but also to teach you a right attitude towards the things of God, which sadly, I cannot believe someone would say they've been here for 10 years and not understand about me. And I thought, well, I'm going to take a step back. No, I, I normally don't 
listen to criticism, but I'm going to take a step back because if I believe I'm going to be accountable, then the first thing that I must reiterate is Matthew 7. You do not judge each other and you do not judge me. I did not come here for you to sit in judgment of the way I am pastoring. I came here because God brought me here. That became clear to me when I was sitting, hold on a minute. That became clear to me when I was sitting on my husband's bedside watching him die. And in a moment, in a flash of clarity, it became as clear as I'm seeing you and looking at you, although without my glasses. I thought God brought me to be his companion and to give him love and for me to have love and to know what a godly man was like in his last years. Well, that was the bonus, but the reality is God brought me like Esther to step up to the challenge, to say, just like Esther, if I perish, I perish. I said to you publicly, if I fall on my face, there's no ego in this. There's no like, hey, I, I want you to. There's only one thing that I want you to know is that I care about you. It matters to me. Whether it's one or 21 or if it's 100, whether it's the 500 out there who sit and aimlessly play on the computer and jest and make mockery of my ministry and of me, I still pray for those people. Do you know why? Because their fate, I happen to believe in heaven and hell, and their fate will be not very pleasant. When I talk about Christian Excuse me, I say this to be probably misconstrued by many. Christian behavior, what I'm talking about is what does Christ look like inside a believer? Like Christ. Does a letter like I just read to you, does that sound like Christ? No. It sounds like somebody who has found the time to obsess about the way I'm instructing you. Now, I want you to hear me, please. If your idea of my tough love is berating, then friend, you would have never survived Gene Scott. <laughs> the applause was from those who were here in those fine moments of glory, what I call the soil your pants moments, because you realized he was right. He became full of anger for what he saw the church doing, and I have the same dilemma now. Don't think this is ego. If the Lord says, and the Lord has not spoken to me, like some people profess the Lord speaks to them, but, if, but if, if this is it, folks, then this is it. I'm happy, but I realize something. We are not fulfilling our calling here according to the Bible. Remember, I started by showing you the taxonomy. Let me talk about that now. Now that I've addressed what I'm dealing with, let me talk about diverse diverse callings in the ministry, and your calling. Now, kind of interesting, I mentioned Barnabas. Please don't turn there because I'm going to take you somewhere else. I'm going to actually take you to Ephesians, but hear me out. I'm going to read something having to do with the New Testament believer. We'll call Barnabas the ambassador of his time, and right after the death of Stephen, it says that there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. So now here's the first time that the word is going to the Gentiles and not the Jews. And it says, the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas. Barnabas' names means a son of comfort. They sent him forth that he should go as far as Antioch. Who, Barnabas, when he came, had seen the grace of God, was glad, exhorted them all, and with purpose of heart, that they would cleave unto the Lord. I read that and I highlighted it because that's what I've been trying to tell you. Abide, cleave, stay, hold on to something. No different than the New Testament church. And then it says, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost, full of the Spirit, and of faith. 
And much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to, to Tarsus to seek Saul. When he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves within the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you that people came, they heard, they listened. They were called Christians because they were following the teaching. They were listening to the way, and it was a transformative way. It wasn't a stagnant way. It wasn't, I'm grooved, and I'm going to do what I want to do. And Barnabas goes to get Saul, the Apostle Paul. Why? Because Paul was a teacher. Barnabas may have had the gift of exhorting them, but Paul was a teacher, which tells you not, each, not every person is given the same gift, and not all gift ministers are the same. They all have to do with the Word of God. Now, turn to Ephesians with me. Please don't let this be just a good talk. If you leave here and you never come back, make this the measuring rod wherever you go. If you go to another church, this isn't a cult. If you go somewhere else, make this the measuring rod. God gave some gifts unto men. That's in verse 8 of Ephesians 4. Those gifts, domata is the Greek word. Just for the clarity of mind is a noun in the accusative, in the neutral and plural. Neutral means it is gender free, either way. <clears throat> Please, you folks who have an issue with that, work it out with God. In verse 11, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And we've said a pastoring teacher is... I don't think you can separate them. But all of these have to do with one thing. All of these offices, gifts, have to do with the Word of God and nothing apart from the Word of God. An evangelist comes into town, not the modern-day evangelist that we see on TV. An evangelist comes to town, and what does he do? He brings the Evangelion is the Greek, the good news. That's where we get our word for evangelist. He brings the good news. And what is the good news? Jesus Christ is risen. He ascended and he's coming back again. You have hope. Don't despair. You have hope. Your life matters in Christ. Now, faith on him. Follow him. Get into the word. There's the evangelist. The prophet, the prophet may come, not like you see on TV. You know, prophets today on TV, you know, they're... If you watch Johnny Carson, you know what that is. <laughs> it's not that. It's a bubbling forth of the Word of God. The Word of God spills over into everything. Not just simply a foretelling prophet seeing future things, although some have that gift, but someone in whom the Word is bubbling up. And then you've got apostles. Those are sent ones ones that God has specifically called and sent somewhere. And lastly, I've combined the, the Greek word for pastor is really shepherd and teacher, which should be combined. And look at what it says in verse 12. I don't care if you've read this a million times. Read it for the million and first time with me. There's a purpose. These people were gifted. They're called gifts to the church, domata. Your King James simply reads, for the perfecting, for the bringing, I'm going to, we'll get to this word perfecting in a minute, for the, for the perfecting of the saints. I'm just reading King James right now, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And if you keep reading right down into verse 16, you're going to see something. There are multiple words talking about growing, maturity, growing up into, bringing, by the way, perf to, to bring to perfection or perfecting is not a good word, not a good translation. Now, the Greek word connotes first to, to give equipment, to equip. And how do we equip? By the word of God. But this word also connotes something else. If you find, if you have a 
a lexicon where you can look up this Greek word, you'll find that this word is also the word used in Galatians 6, where if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, which I've just demonstrated to you, by the way. Not a spirit of anger. If these people are listening, I pray for your mind to be changed, not so that you come back here, but you get the idea that you're in the wrong, not me. I've only done my duty to tell you, if you don't care enough about the fact that God has given you an opportunity to do exactly what, I'm using the word of God in our taxonomy, a purpose, the objective purpose, which is the Bible. God gave some gifts to the equipping, which also should be understood as that word is also used of mending of nets, restoring people, giving them the tools to become what they were indeed intended to be in Christ. That word is used of mending of nets when it says they were mending their nets. It's the same word. And it also connotes something else. The fact that these gifts were given to the church by God to equip, to restore, but also we'll call it to help you because if you could do it on your own, God wouldn't need to give gifts to the church. Now distinguish between the clerical mindset, for example, Catholicism, where you just follow the priest and you just go along, and even if you don't understand what the Mass, what he said in the Mass, you've got to just go along, which I'm not suggesting. I've told you that's why I give you the information, I tell you, you work it out. Well, Pastor, what's your opinion on abortion? What's your opinion on politics? You don't want to know. And it's better you don't know. But that's an opinion. That is not Bible. And I'm only interested in one thing, what the Bible says. Everybody has an opinion. <laughs> glory, glory, hallelujah. That's what I said. So there's a purpose here. God gave these gifts. They all, these gift ministers all have to do with the word in one way or another to bring something about the saints, not oh, 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 oh. saints, hagios, the ones who have been set apart. You, you who are listening, who desire to hear, you're a saint. Even if you're a drug addict and you're an alcoholic or you're a, a thief, listening in the, in the sound of my voice and even remotely interested means you are set apart, not something that people have twisted it into. So there is an equipping, a mending, a restorative process going on for a specific purpose. Read it with me. Not for the work of the ministry. In the accusative, to, pointing right at the ministry, to the work of the ministry. Well, what does that mean? Well, that first means that the gift minister is not a donkey saddled to do all the work, which at times I have to tell you, I feel I am probably the luckiest person in the world to have the staff I have around me. Their care, but don't make a mistake. These people are not operating autonomous, go out there and spin on your own. I still have to carry the burden of the decisions. The ultimate authority to make those decisions is on my back. So there's a purpose here to the work of the ministry, for the edifying, for the building up of the body of Christ. That means each person in the sound of my voice has been given a gift. Now, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, and not all are an ear, not all are an eye, thank God, not all are other parts of the body. Although at times I tend to think there are more other parts than <laughs> than ears and eyes, and that'll, that'll hit you a little bit later. I'm sorry, listen, I told you, I have my carnal moments. That was just one of them, all right? There'll be a few more before I'm done, I'm sure. What, what I want you to hear before I, I, I read something out of 1 Corinthians is what the 26th translation says for that verse 12. With a view to the fitting of the saints for the work of ministering, for the perfecting of the saints to labor in their appointed service, to fit his people for the work of the ministry, in order fully to equip his people for work of serving, 
in order to equip the saints for the work of serving, for the immediate equipment of God's people to the work of service. You get the idea. The problem with the church today, and many people who come into the church, is they think the church exists for them. And they have long forgotten the principles of Ezekiel 44, that inner court ministry begins with first ministry under the Lord. You forget that, suddenly the church begins to revolve around you and it becomes very easy to say, my church. The minute you, we sometimes toss that around, I'm going to say something and you can quote me on this. If you want to put that personal possessive pronoun in front of church, then you, be, you better be willing to fight and fight for that which you have called my church. Last time I checked, not a one of you, including yours truly, has resisted under blood to be able to say my church. No one has given their blood or sacrificed their life like Jesus did. So it's his church. And when you understand that it's his church and we are just graciously given the opportunity to come in and be a part of the body, that's radical. That means an attitude adjustment because my church does not really exist. I told you, I'm just a steward. I don't know what time I have. I could, oh God, I could get another 50 years. <laughs> you don't know. But at some point, I'm going to pass from the scene and there'll be, if Jesus doesn't come back in my lifetime, there'll be someone else and that person will be a steward. You know what I liken it to? I travel to the institutions. I have outlived in the years I've been traveling more wardens and more chaplains than I can count. But guess who stays? The inmates. <laughs> they might be able to say it's my prison. <laughs> Just saying. But let's get back to this. So there's a purpose. You're not just here randomly and for yourself. I said, first start with edifying the body of Christ, which means, as I said, Ezekiel 44, inner court ministry unto the Lord. Praying, talking, reading, listening, all of that encompasses ministry unto the Lord. Something that is not for the self, but designed completely to what is well-pleasing to Him. Now, we come into the church, and we all, we're kind of burdened down with our baggage, and we've got our troubles, and that's fine. But remember, the ministry, that inner court ministry, is important not to be neglected. And the building up of the body, the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ, really what it says is you have a part, just as I have a part, of adding to the body, not in man's ideas. I called somebody a couple of days ago and I said, tell me, what does your church do? to tell people about their, response, their stewardship responsibility. That's money, that's all the things I've talked about, including repopulating. Oh, we have programs. Oh, well, like what type of programs? Well, we have a special night where people come in and uh, they can bring their friends and family. I guess that's the night where everybody puts on their best behavior and their best face and makes the people feel really welcome until they're in and then... <laughs> It's kind of like a marriage, you know, after the honeymoon, it's like, yeah, who cares about the sweatpants? Let's just go out, you know? Right. <laughs> and the wives laughed because they could. <laughs> but it's just like that. Now, why do I want to play that game? I don't. I told you if God's not in it, I don't want it. But I do understand something that's missing here. If I am standing and I'm going to give account, then I am going to give you instructions that come from this book regarding the building up. And the building up of the body of Christ add to this, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man in the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And here's the key. If, it, if this wasn't a problem, why would Paul have addressed this? He says that we henceforth be no more children, immature, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love. Now, if that's not what I've done today, even to what I've said is quite egregious for me, this is done in love to show you 
I don't only care about this church, I care about my calling enough to tell you. When you're not only out of line, that's not berating. That's called using the shepherd's staff, which, as I said, I don't get pleasure in. But sometimes I have to. And I've told you, I'm going to fight for this church. I have been fighting for this church for 10 years. That doesn't earn me anything, anywhere, except I do believe what the scripture says, fight the good fight of faith. I translated that agonize the good agony, and it, boy, that has come to be an absolute truth. These are not cheap words. I will fight for this church. I would die for this church. But I will not have you come in here and treat me or this church by letter or by attitude with anything less than if you will leave today and not come back, go somewhere and find some respect for God and God's person. You may not like the appearance of the container. You may hate the voice. But the message is the message that God gives from his word. Now, if you hate that, you probably hate God. Immaturity is a large part of the problem. And I have not come to you today as a hypocrite. I've come to you today speaking the truth in love. Sometimes the truth is not easy to take. But listen to what should happen here. Speaking the truth in love, that they may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. That's not saying, hey, look at me. That's saying, hey, look to Christ. That's why I said, you follow me as I follow Christ. I've weathered the storms. I know what it takes to get by. The minute you take your eyes off of Christ, you will sink, which is why I keep teaching the word. And no, I do not have a spirit of fear. What I have is a spirit that says, God's word said, and I have ordered my life by that. You may say I'm delusional or maybe I'm oversteeped and maybe it's time for me to be like a tea bag, this guarded. But this is what I have come to the faith in, that God is not a liar, that when he said he will send his word, and I, am, I call myself the proof coin of that, he said he would send his word and it would not return void. Who would have thought almost 20 years ago when I heard Gene Scott that I would be standing in front of you doing what I'm doing today, and this is what it means when the word does not return void, but accomplishes that which he sent it out to do, which is the same operation that he's doing in and through you as the body of Christ. Now, I'm not done. He says here in verse 16, from whom the whole body fit joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Not decrease, increase. Do you know what brings decrease? Complacency. A hireling pastor or preacher. You may say, well, no, I've seen people out there, they kind of look like hirelings and they're quite prosperous. Yes, but when it's time for the separation to occur, when Jesus comes to separate the sheep from the goat, believe me, it's not going to be a great multitude as some would have you believe. And something more is said here, which I think is quite interesting. Um, many times we read this and we, we don't go on to the next chapter of this because basically what is being said here is that you've all been given a gift. Whether you recognize that gift or not, I, I don't know, I can't tell you. And don't start frustrating God and saying, well, I can't see my gift. Show me my gift. That'd be as bad as me when Dr. Scott ordained me saying, why, 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 why? I think God was saying, shut up already. <laughs> but let me show you what I mean, because Paul lays it out quite plainly. And I'll try to wrap this up. In 1 Corinthians 12, and by the way, Paul in his day when he came or wrote these letters, they were corrective letters. They were not letters of spiritual massage. If you really read them, you understand he came, and at some point, he had to use the rod of correction. Stuff that was going on in the church, whoo! You can read it for yourself. It's, uh... But in 1 Corinthians 12, he says, now concerning the spirituals, the spiritual gifts, spirituals, and he goes on to say, there are diversity of gifts, but the same spirit. 
And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but is the same God which worketh all in all. Now, as you read this with me, I want you to think of something. Why did Paul say, till we all come to the unity of the faith? Because if that same spirit is operating, oh, we all have independent thoughts and we're, we can be independent thinkers. But when it comes to the word and the calling, my calling and your calling, there is no ambiguity. You understand? You have a purpose. You're not just here just by accident, just to take in. You are here for a purpose. I'm sorry. I am totally sorry that maybe some of you didn't understand that. Don't just think you were called into the kingdom and now suddenly you just, you're just going to sit in a mass. Even Paul says here, there are diverse, there's a diversity of gifts. Not everybody has the same gift, but everybody has gifts given by the Spirit. Everybody. You may not know what that gift is. For some of you, it may be a spirit, which is not listed in here, but I'll say it like this, a spirit of compassion. You have a spirit of understanding. Some people have the gift of faith. Other people have a gift. Their faith is so great that people say, well, this person has healing capacities in whatever way. And he goes on to basically itemize them. He says, the manifestation of the spirit is given to every person, not every man, but to all, to profit with all. For to one is given by the spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, by the same spirit to another faith, by the same Spirit to another, gifts of healing. By the same Spirit to another, the working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, diverse kinds of tongues, interpretations of tongues. But all of these worketh that one and same self Spirit, dividing to every man or every person severally as he will. And then there's something radical. Please read this with me because this tells you when I get letters like this, this is not the Spirit of God. This is the Spirit of the devil. Why? Verse 25, all of this is given for us to be working together as a complete body in motion, not standing still, moving ahead. And verse 25 says that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. Well, tell me that you would you'd confront me to my face and be that brutal about something you know nothing about, which is my pastoral care for you. Now, let me just make it clear. I am a gift minister to the church. I fit into one of those categories. You are called and chosen out of a, a group of people maybe who care not to hear the word of God. That makes you pretty special. And you're not just calling for the sake of randomly, like a lotto, your number was called. You were called for a purpose. Now, not all people are called here to repopulate. Not all people are called here to work in air shift. Not all people are called here to do security. But every person is capable of doing something which is a gift of God. Now, what's complicated about that? Now, if I don't stir up that gift which is inside of you, which is what Paul was saying to Timothy, if I don't stir up that gift, I'm not doing my part. Your part isn't to sit. You know, when, when your end of days come, I don't care how many or how few gather at your home going, just as I say it for myself. It won't really matter. People gather around to eulogize what you may have done or what they think you did, or maybe they just lie about you and say good things because <laughs> that's the thing to do. But there's only one thing that's going to matter. Everything else gets burnt up. Your commitment and faith in him, that's the only thing that's going to remain. Paul said it from faith to faith all the way home. That's how you get your crown. That's how you get God's glory. You don't get it now. You don't get it dispensed in, in a moment or in a lifetime. But the work of the ministry, gift ministers given, you are gifts as well. And each is given gifts. And I'm not going to have this church cheapened by people thinking I am some uh, person who takes pleasure in correction probably because some of these people have never seen a shepherd's heart. They don't know how to take it. So I can't do anything about these folks. Maybe they will write and say, you're right, Pastor, we're sitting in judgment of you even though you warned us not to. I can't fix that. I can only pray for them. The same way I can only pray for you that you're understanding, you may understand what I'm here to do, and I'm here to equip you and help you make it in. That is the pastor's work. And along the way, I teach you the lessons that I, too, have applied to my heart. 
And guess what? If we understand that, we will grow up. We will not be spiritual babies forever, but we will grow up to come to a unity in Christ Jesus. That is my goal, friends. That is my love and my care for you. And until you decide to leave, you have somebody standing in front of you who I've told you, I make mistakes. I'm not perfect. But the one thing that I have soundly taken to my heart as the absoluteness is to know this word, to take it, and for me to bring it to you as I abide in it, that you may understand what it is that we are pressing towards. It is not fundamentalism. It is not perfectionism. It is the life of faith. And sometimes that life requires a little nudge, and sometimes it's a good swift kick. But all done from me in the spirit of love, I pray that you receive it in Jesus' name. That is my message. Come on up. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.